Since the fall of Atlantis, Satan and his minions have been working tirelessly to end all goodness on this planet. But God and the Brotherhood of Light have put together their own plan to defeat the dark side. Throughout history, many prophets have come forth to speak of the coming golden age of humanity. This truth was made known only to fall silent on the deaf ears of the ignorant masses, but change is on the horizon. By the time of the Renaissance, humanity had begun to rise from its slumber. Slowly, mysticism and superstition began to be replaced with science and logic. It is here 400 years ago, at the height of Tudor England, where this story begins. A secret marriage was arranged between Queen Elizabeth I and Sir Robert Dudley. Due to Dudley's political ambitions, the Queen chose to maintain her virgin queen status. From this marriage came forth Francis Bacon, who was raised by an adopted family. At the age of 15, while his parents were arguing, he overheard the truth, that he was the future heir of the King of England. All his life, the Queen kept dangling in front of him the mantle of power. To be or not to be, that was his question. Alas, it was not to be. In 1603, Queen Elizabeth appointed King James VI of Scotland to be her successor. Instead of letting this defeat him, Francis chose to rise above his circumstances in the pursuit of scholarly and political interests. He had the King James Bible translated. He wrote the Shakespearean sonnets. He persuaded King James I to charter Newfoundland and was an officer in the Virginia Company. He was King James's Lord Chancellor, and he fathered deductive reasoning, which set the grounds for science and technology to liberate humanity. Secretly, he was a master of the alchemical sciences and the occult. It was here that he began to remember his past lives as the Prophet Samuel, Plato, St. Joseph, Merlin, Roger Bacon, and Christopher Columbus. When he was the Prophet Samuel, he helped liberate the children of Abraham from the bondage of corrupt priests and the Philistines. In the 5th century, while Europe was falling into the Dark Ages, he returned again as Merlin to help King Arthur establish Britain into a stronghold against ignorance and superstition, a place where Christ's achievement could flower and devotion to the One Source could prosper in the quest for the Holy Grail. It was later in the 19th century when his efforts blossomed when the United Kingdom became a place where industry and individual initiative could thrive as never before in 12,000 years. As a medieval alchemist Roger Bacon, he predicted the invention of a hot air balloon, a flying machine, a magnifying glass, and mechanically propelled ships and carriages, and amazingly, he wrote of them as if he had actually had seen them. He believed true knowledge stems not from the authority of others, nor from a blind allegiance to antiquated dogmas, but instead is a highly personal experience, a light that is communicated only to the innermost privacy of the individual through the impartial channels of all knowledge and of all thought. Because of the heretical nature of these beliefs, the church imprisoned him, where he remained for his final years. In his Opus Magis, he wrote of a voyage of three ships and a discovery of a new world. The sea between the end of Spain on the west and the beginning of India on the east is navigable in a very few days if the wind is favorable. In his next life as Christopher Columbus, he was inspired by these words, and along with a prophecy made by Isaiah, he knew a new world would be found whereby God would recover the remnant of his people, and shall assemble the outcast of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Isaiah 11.12 When Francis Bacon became conscious of these incarnations, he sought those hidden treasures he placed away until his rebirth. At the age of 12, Francis conceived of a time when mankind would go through a period of great restoration. In 1620, he placed this vision for humanity in his book, The Great Instauration, in which he formalized how to change the whole wide world through the restoration of true knowledge after centuries of obscurity and neglect. It was here that he first devised a scientific method that ultimately launched a new English renaissance. 
Many of his ideas were kept in the shroud of secret societies in order to hide from the prying eyes of church officials. With help from his brother Anthony and some friends who were students at Gray's Inn Law School, they created a secret society known as the Knights of the Helmet. They chose this name from the goddess Athena, who was depicted as wearing Pelé's helmet of invisibility and carrying a golden spear of knowledge. The goddess Athena brings about wisdom, intellect, and the moral side of human life. Athena's helmet of invisibility represents her silent war against ignorance and sloth. The knights of the helmet also consider themselves invisible warriors against ignorance and sloth, as they secretly worked to expand the English language by creating new literatures not written in Latin, but instead in words all Englishmen could understand, such as found within the King James Bible. In 1611, the King James edition of the Bible was commissioned in order to unite the Anglican and Puritan church leaders. After a long series of edits by nondescript translators, the final draft was handed to King James, who then passed it on to Francis Bacon so that he could revise the Bible into a marvelous piece of literary work which is still being used today. Many of these works were written anonymously under pen names such as William Shakespeare. Francis chose this name because the goddess Athena was known to carry a golden spear of knowledge, which she would use to strike at the serpent of ignorance. When sunlight would strike her spear, it was known to tremble, thus the people would say she was shaking her spear again, hence the word Shakespeare. In a symbolic gesture, Francis would shake his pen as a spear of knowledge to slay the dragons of foolishness. Written within the Shakespearean plays is a hidden cipher which shows Francis Bacon not only as a true heir of the King of England, but also of Queen Elizabeth's secret marriage to the Earl of Leicester and her preceding two sons. For upon his birth, Francis Bacon was given over to Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne, who pleaded with the Queen for the life of the child. Queen Elizabeth rejected her son because she feared her subjects would choose a male heir over herself to rule the kingdom. Some historical documents hint of the secret marriage and her two children, such as found within this portrait. However, any talk of this during the time of Queen Elizabeth would have resulted in imprisonment or death. After a happy childhood spent with Sir Nicholas and Lady Anne, on his 12th birthday, he was enrolled in Cambridge University. Mysteriously, Queen Elizabeth provided the funds for his education. At the age of 15, he discovered the true identity of his royal blood, so Queen Elizabeth sent Francis abroad to France, placing him at a comfortable distance from her throne. While in France, he studied cipher codes to learn new ways to protect confidential information in England, and he also worked with Masonic secret societies which sought to reform the French language. Three years later, upon his return to England, he brought back these same ideas and created a secret society known as the Knights of the Helmet, which through their literary works would ultimately modernize the English language by standardizing the spelling of words. The Knights of the Helmet was part of a larger movement of secret societies found within Rosicrucian teachings, which dated back to the time of Atlantis. The Rosicrucians were a loose-knit group of secret societies which believed knowledge or wisdom was eternal and should be freely available to those who seek it. Just like with the Knights of the Helmet, the Rosicrucian secret society was also part of this movement. The Rosicrucian is shorthand for the Society of the Golden and Rosy Cross, which was founded in 1571 to protect Queen Elizabeth after she was excommunicated by the Pope and secretly they sought to bring about universal enlightenment through the use of the alchemical process. The golden cross symbolized the transmutation of the base elements into spiritual light. The red cross symbolized the heraldic color of the metal gold. These colors were often associated with Saint George and Archangel Michael. And the rose symbolized the heart of the cross where one could find love, intelligence, and enlightenment within the human soul. Just like with Athena's helmet of invisibility, members of the Rosicrucian would make silent oaths under the principle of sub rosa or beneath the rose. They believed it was best to be discreet and conceal some things while revealing others in order to create a treasure trail to those who seek truth. And as Athena would shake her spear at the snakes of ignorance, so could St. George shake his spear at the dragons of ice. 
members of these societies understood that if an individual could be a powerful force of change, so could they, in larger numbers, slay the dragons of the world. It was here, as a member of the Rosicrucian Secret Society, that Francis Bacon became inspired to write his famous Great Instauration, which would restore paradise on earth through knowledge and virtue. In addition to the Rosicrucian and the Knights of the Helmet Secret Societies was the Freemason Secret Society whose members passed down the secrets of building the massive cathedrals and castles of Europe. After the death of Queen Elizabeth in 1603, King James succeeded to the throne. During his reign, Francis was promoted to Viscount St. Albans and the Lord Chancellor, which was the highest positions of power one could obtain in that era other than the king himself. He was given the task to reform Freemasonry, which in late Elizabethan England was more of a social clique for the elite. He sought to change operative Freemasonry of the medieval stone guilds into speculative Freemasonry, that is, a fraternal order of philosophers that would create the world as God made it and not as men or the church made it, a place where religious and political strife could be placed aside under its three great Masonic principles of brotherly love, relief of the poor, and seekers of truth. He then redrafted the nine degrees of the Knights of Templar into 33 degrees, which became the basis of modern-day Freemasonry. Many of these initiations were based on Christian ethics, with a focus on the realization of one's own inner Christ consciousness. Francis chose 33 initiations of Freemasonry from a simple Elizabethan cipher, which equaled to the numerical value of his signature. By assigning a number for each letter of the alphabet, the name Bacon equals to 33. Continuing his mission that he first begun as Christopher Columbus, he persuaded King James to sign the Virginia Charter, which began the colonization of the New World with England's first permanent colony at Jamestown. Here, his Masonic teachings of inner divine potential, freedom, and enlightenment spread, which later resulted in the creation of the United States of America under its Masonic founding fathers. In his book, The New Atlantis, he foretold of the Pacific Island, where science prevailed over ignorance and superstition. This island had no rulers, but instead, a learned council of men who had proven themselves through scientific achievement. He envisioned the new world as this new Atlantis, a place where freedom and peace would reign under a Masonic order without despotic rulers trying to control their fellow man. A place where the heritage of the House of Solomon could once again prosper under a golden age culture of science and logic. By 1620, his literary fame and political success had begun to spread, which created much jealousy amongst his fellow members of parliament. Eventually, they accused him of corruption, which was later proven unjust. After falling from public grace, he continued his work secretly reforming the Rosicrucian mystery schools and Masonic fraternities. His motto of one lives best by the hidden life describes him perfectly as his efforts continue to secretly influence humanity. Francis once said, the great end of life is not knowledge but action. True to his word, in 1626 he faked his own philosopher's death and attended his funeral in disguise with another body in the coffin. He then traveled to the Rakotsi Mansion in the Carpathian Mountain region of Transylvania, which is now located in modern-day Romania. Here, during the reign of Ferenic Rakotsi I, he continued his studies of alchemy, preparing him for his physical ascension under the watchful eye of Master R, who worked with the great divine director. After making two million right decisions, spanning hundreds of thousands of years of incarnations, he was granted ascension. The highest form of alchemy is not the transmutation of the base elements into gold, but instead, the transmutation of the soul into oneness with the Creator. On May 1st, 1684, he finally mastered these secrets and ascended into the 14th dimension, transmuting his mortal body into an immortal angel, conquering death itself. After the ascension process occurs, normally a soul would choose to move on to serve in higher dimensions. However, Francis chose to join the Great White Brotherhood of Light, where souls that have vowed to stick with the earth until the day all humanity could ascend. These so-called ascended masters rarely interact with humanity, but Francis chose a different path. 
he wanted to return back in a human body to teach others how to overcome the laws of the physical universe and to help usher in the coming golden age of humanity. His karmic board granted his request and he materialized a new body as the Count de Saint Germain or the Count of Saint Germain. He chose his name from the Latin word Sanctus Germanus meaning Holy Brother. The Count was known as the Wonder Man of Europe as he would amaze nobility and royalty alike, many of which commented on his elaborate shoes stubbed with $40,000 diamonds and pearls. Amazingly, he was able to turn rocks into diamonds and remove any flaws. He could write two poems with both hands at the same time. He could read a book by waving his hand over it. He spoke every language, traveled by thought, and worked for peace. He was an accomplished pianist, singer, and violinist. Those who have known him said he played the violin equal to or even surpassing the greatest virtuosos of that period. And Saint Germain even remarked that he had reached the extreme limit possible for his talent. He was also known for his artwork and alchemy. He taught Franz Mesmer his fundamental ideas on personal magnetism and hypnosis, and he initiated Cleistro into the Masonic Order. And with his elixir of life and positive thinking, he never aged at all. According to Germain, it is the activity of our nerves, the flame of our desire, the acid of our fears which daily consume our organism. He who succeeds in raising himself above his emotions and suppressing in himself anger and the fear of illness is capable of overcoming the attrition of the years and attaining an age at least double that at which men now die of old age. He served as a counselor to kings and princes, he fought against deceptive ministers, and he handed the torch of wisdom to Masons and Rosicrucians alike. Prince Karl von Hess described him as one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived, the friend of humanity whose heart was concerned only with the happiness of others. He worked closely with royalty to help usher in the United States of Europe, but these plans came to an end when Napoleon saw power for his own demise. Despite this failure, he was instrumental in the creation of the United States of America, which he knew would usher in a golden age which would last forever. After Saint Germain ascended, he remained in Transylvania, but details of this period of his life remain in the cloak of the Shroud of Mystery. Historians hint that he was possibly adopted into the Royal House of Hungary as the third son of Francis Rokotsi II, using a different name and identity as a convenient disguise. By the year 1700, Transylvania was conquered territory of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Francis Rokotsi II became aware of how Austrian Emperor Leopold had placed his subjects under the bondage of high taxes and oppressive government. He led a successful revolt to liberate his people, but it is unclear what role, if any, Saint Germain played in this plot. Rumors of an elixir of life which prolonged his lifespan followed Germain throughout his years. In 1710, Saint Germain appeared in Venice, where he met the musician Jean-Philippe Ramou and the ambassadors to Vienna, the Countess du jean -Lee. He introduced himself under the name of Marquis du Montferrat. At that time, he appeared to be 40 years old and gave the Countess a memorable gift of this magical elixir that maintained her youth for a very long time. Fifty years later, Comtesse du Jolie met him once again while visiting Madame Pompadour's house, who was the mistress of King Louis XV. She inquired if his father had been in Venice back in 1710. The Count replied, No, Madame, but I myself was living in Venice at the end of the last and the beginning of this century. I had the honor to pay your court then, and you were kind enough to admire a little barcarolle of my composing. The Countess could not believe it. But if that is true, she gasped, you must be at least a hundred years old. The Count smiled. That, madame, is not impossible. Suspecting the Count was less than truthful, Madame Pompadour inquired again about the Countess and her tale of a so-called elixir life. Germain replied with a smile, it is not impossible, but I confess, it is likely that this lady, for whom I have the greatest respect, is talking nonsense. Undaunted, Madame Pompadour tried many times to get that elixir, but Germain would not share his secrets. However, he was able to make her a cosmetic which enhanced her beauty. 
Hints of his true age continued to surround him with intrigue when in 1723, Saint Germain showed the mother of the Comtesse du Jolie, a miniature portrait of his own mother which he kept on his arm. When she saw a beautiful woman dressed in a costume unfamiliar to her own time, the Countess inquired, to what period does this costume belong? The Count merely smiled and changed the subject. If Saint Germain truly had an elixir of life, it would mean he had ultimately mastered the secrets of the Philosopher's Stone, which medieval alchemists believed could transmute the base metals, such as lead, into gold. It seemed likely, if anyone could have figured this out, it would have been Saint Germain, as he closely worked with the Fathers Lucis and with the Knights of the Brothers of Asia, who studied the Rosicrucian and Hermetic Sciences of Alchemy, of which the three parts of the Azoth constituted the Philosopher's Stone. No one really knows if Saint Germain was truly able to turn lead into gold, but in 1727 it appears he had done just that. These secret money-making techniques were shared with certain German bankers and monarchies in the hopes that the wealth generated would benefit all humanity, but instead, they squandered it for themselves. So in 1729, he banished support of these power brokers and created the World Trust. From its inception, he stipulated that the World Trust would be released by the year 2000, but this is not an easy task to do, as you will soon see. Saint Germain realized humanity would never be ready for the knowledge and technology of the Aquarian Age until mankind could put aside their destructive sciences and religions and accept the heart of which lies of both, that is, to enter one's heart and harness their own unlimited potential. After the establishment of the World Trust, Saint Germain traveled to the court of the Shah of Persia, where he remained from 1737 to 1742. Here he studied the secrets of nature, of which he learned the closely guarded science of precipitating and enlarging gemstones, which was manifested through psychic powers. The Count's love affair with precious stones was well known among his friends and associates. At one point, Saint Germain showed a small box to Madame Pompadour, which contained topazes, emeralds, and diamonds worth at least $9 million in today's money. While in Paris, the aristocracy marveled at his diamond-encrusted shoe buckles, but yet no one could identify him or his great source of wealth. Many years later, Madame du Say described within her memoirs how Saint Germain wore an assortment of diamond rings of great value and how his watch and snuff box were ornamented with a profusion of precious stones. She also had witnessed Saint Germain remove a flaw from a large diamond which had belonged to King Louis XV, increasing his value from 6,000 livres to 10,000 livres. The king was never able to get over his astonishment and would often confide that if Saint Germain could increase the value of gemstones, he must be a millionaire. Yet no one could discover his source of wealth, as he never kept any records or held any traceable bank accounts. He would always stay in fine hotels and apartments and would always have as much cash available as needed. When a curious minister spent two years keeping tabs on him, he concluded that Saint Germain paid for everything in real money, but did not have a source of a financial backing. When Saint Germain was confronted about this, he responded, I hold the whole of nature in my hands, and as God created the world, I can draw what I want out of nothing. In 1743, he traveled to London, where for two years he remained in a house on St. Martin Street. During this time, he conducted many alchemical experiments within his laboratory, probably manufacturing artificial diamonds. He was known to frequently visit the Kit Kat Club, where he would mingle with members of the highest nobility. He astounded members with two inventions he was working on, the steam train and steam boat, both of which were predicted by Roger Bacon. Twenty years later, James Walt prototyped his idea by building a steam engine, and later, in 1829, George Stevenson built the first public railway operated by a steam train. After his stay in London, he visited his friend Frederick the Great in his castle of Sans Souci in Potsdam, where Voltaire was also an honored guest. In a letter addressed to Frederick, Voltaire later wrote, The Count of Saint Germain is a man who was never born, who will never die, and who knows everything. In 1749, while at Versailles, King Louis XV was introduced to the Count by his peer of France to relieve some of his boredom. Soon after, he meets the King's mistress, Madame Pompadour, and becomes a court favorite. The King was captivated by his stories of travel all around the world and his wisdom of the alchemical arts. 
In a gesture of good faith, St. Germain gave away his invention of inexpensive dyes, which helped increase employment and wealth of the nation, while lowering the manufactured cost of clothing, so that commoners could dress as good as the nobility class. In 1755, King Louis XV recruited him to travel to Southeast Asia to infiltrate the British East India Company as a spy. He journeyed in the same ship as General Robert Clive, possibly as a ship's doctor. Here he became aware of the British schemes to subjugate India at the Battle of Pulaski and the recapture of Calcutta. Thanks to his efforts, he saved the lives of many French troops who were protecting the Indian people at that time. When he returned to Europe in 1758, King Louis XV granted him a royal favor for his work in India with a suite of rooms at the Royal Chateau of Chambord in Touraine to continue his experiments of alchemy that King Louis XV sometimes participated in. In a letter written in 1773, Graf Karl Kambenzel of Brussels commented about these alchemical experiments of which the most important were the transmutation of iron into a metal as beautiful as gold. In 1762, he traveled to Russia in a secret plot which put Catherine the Great on the throne. Then in 1774, he returned back to France to deliver a message to the now crowned Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Saint Germain delivered a warning of an approaching conspiracy that would soon occur within the next 15 years, which would create a bloodthirsty republic whose scepter would be the executioner's knife. Sadly, this warning went unheeded, and among the final entries within Marie Antoinette's diary, she recorded her regret at ignoring the Count's advice. Between 1774 and 1784, the Count spent his time traveling throughout Germany and Austria, petitioning the monarchies to work together to avert the French Revolution and to create a United States of Europe. Though the monarchies enjoyed being entertained by Saint Germain's marvelous alchemical experiments, neither they nor their jealous ministers wished to relinquish their power to a unified Europe. With his plans in Europe crumbling apart, he then turned his eyes to the now prosperous New World, because he knew America would play a key role in raising people's consciousness into the Golden Age. On a steamy July 4th, 1776, the most influential leaders of the American colonies were locked in Independence Hall, debating whether they should risk a traitor's death by signing the Declaration of Independence. Even though the doors were locked, Saint Germain appeared in the balcony and delivered a fiery speech calling forth the Founding Fathers to sign that document. He continued, The words of the Declaration will live in the world long after our bones are dust. To the mechanic they will speak hope. To the slave in the mines, freedom. But to the coward kings, these words will speak tones of warning they cannot choose but hear. Sign that parchment, sign. If the next moment the gibbet's rope is about your neck, sign by all hopes in life and death as men as husbands as fathers brothers or be a curse forever sign not only for yourselves but for all ages for that parchment will be the textbook of freedom the bible of the rights of man forever i would beg you to sign that parchment for the sake of those millions whose very breath is now hushed in a tense expectation as they look up to you for the awful words you are free Unafraid of the repercussions by King George III, these brave men boldly rushed forward and signed their names. So inspired by this speech, John Hancock signed his name in large bold letters so that the king would be able to read it without his spectacles. During the Revolutionary War, Saint Germain was also instrumental in persuading King Louis XVI to appoint the French General Rochambeau over 6,000 troops to serve in George Washington's Continental Army. Historians now agree that this assistance played a critical role in a decisive victory for the American forces. The signing of the Declaration of Independence eventually led way to the liberation of the American colonies into a more perfect union, a place where the virtues of righteousness and freedom could reign under the banner of the United States of America. But trouble was now brewing in Europe. Not only were his plans for the United States of Europe crumbling apart, so too was his Masonic secret society, which had now been infiltrated by the satanic faction of the Bavarian Lodge of Freemasonry, who under the helm of a Jewish Rothschild agent, Adam Weishoff, 
began to rewrite Masonic initiations based on Luciferic teachings of the Talmud, in which enlightenment would be attained through the worship of Lucifer as the ultimate light bearer. They now dubbed themselves the Illuminati and sought to divide the Goyim or the non-Jews through political, social, economic, or religious means. The Rashads planned to use the Illuminati and Freemasonry to destroy the masses so that they could take over the world and to steal all the people's gold so it could be returned to King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. This is why the Rashads financed the creation of Israel and why they are considered its patron saint. This was in direct opposition to St. Germain's version of Freemasonry, in which he envisioned universal enlightenment of one's own inner divine potential would spread to a small group of initiates, and then in turn to other initiates in a vast spiral of spiritual radiation to all humanity. But much to St. Germain's horror, these dark teachings began to spread like a blight within the Masonic lodges. To counteract the Illuminati movement, he recruited a close group of friends, including Prince Charles of Hesse Castle and Cagliostro, to create a secret society known as the Philolathes, which taught that mankind had infinite possibilities and that they must strive to release themselves of physical matter in order to communicate with higher intelligences. But the Philolathes society never caught on. At the 1782 Wilsenbad Convention, the Lodges voted to merge Freemasonry with the Illuminati, thus creating the notorious form of modern-day Freemasonry. Three years later, at the Great Paris Convention of 1785, he and along with Calistro, Franz Mesmer, and St. Martin tried in vain to bring reconciliation amongst the Rosicrucians, Illuminists, and Masons alike. Had St. Germain been successful in redirecting Freemasonry into a philosopher's organization such as the Philolathes, he would have been able to avert the evil chain of events which have since occurred in preceding generations. After the convention of 1785, St. Germain fell into disgrace. This time, the Jesuits had falsely accused him of immorality, conspiracy to create anarchy, and infidelity. As a result, he played an increasingly diminished role within the very society he had founded nearly 200 years prior. Soon after 1785, the Masonic Lodges began to systematically erase all traces of Saint Germain from their order, but with one blazing exception. The letter G, which symbolizes the word Germain, can still be found between the Masonic Square and Compass. Despite Freemasonry's attempts to erase all traces of Saint Germain from their order, his vision presses on. Humanity will be set free from its shackles of slavery and death. After the Masonic Schism, Saint Germain worked with his close friend, Prince Charles of Hesse Castle in Schleswig, Germany, where they would conduct experiments in alchemy. Growing weary of his failed efforts in Europe, Saint Germain sought to remove attention from himself in a more private life. So on February 27, 1784, Saint Germain once again faked his own death. After his funeral, the behavior of Prince Charles became uncommunicative and he would often change the subject if anyone spoke of the Count. Those who knew the Prince closely became convinced that not only was the Count still alive, but it appeared the Prince was an accomplice to Saint Germain's pretend death. Most historians believe that the Count had now died at this point. However, he resurfaced once again in order to block the attempts of the Illuminati from toppling the French monarchy. In the 18th century, the Rothschild family had managed to become fabulously wealthy by loaning money to the monarchies, but now they desired to open up new markets. They wanted to capture the other 97% of the population who were not royalty, to create a new class of consumers which could then be enslaved with debt. So they recruited Adam Weishoff to provide Maximilian Robespierre their plans for a French Revolution. Early one Sunday morning in 1788, Saint Germain visited the Countess de Dumas, who was one of Marie Antoinette's ladies in waiting. He requested an audience with the Queen to discuss ways to avert the French Revolution. When she arrived, the Count told her, Madame, for twenty years I was on intimate terms with the late King, who deigned to listen to me with kindness. He made use of my poor abilities on several occasions, and I do not think he regretted giving me his confidence. The Count then informed her of a plot by the Encyclopedias and the Duc de Chartreux to overthrow the monarchy. He instructed her to inform the King of this coming conspiracy and requested that the King would not consult with his chief advisor, the Count du Morpa. 
but the king ignored his warning and immediately consulted with the count. And in the midst of the conversation, Saint Germain appeared to confront the Count de Maurepas with his plans to commit treachery, and said to him, In opposing yourself to my seeing the monarch, you are losing the monarchy, for I have but a limited time to give to France. This time over, I shall not be seen here again until after three successive generations have gone down to the grave. The second warning from Saint Germain came on July 14, 1789, after the queen said farewell to the Duchess du Polignac, she opened a letter and read, My words have fallen on your ears in vain, and you have reached the period of which I informed you. All the Polignacs and their friends are doomed to death. The Count d'Artois will perish. On October 5, 1789, Comtesse de Dema received Saint Germain's farewell letter, in which he wrote, All is lost, Countess. The sun is the last which was set on the monarchy. Tomorrow it will exist no more. My advice has been scorned, now it is too late. He then asked the Countess to meet him early the next morning, at which she was informed that the time when he could help France had now passed. He continued, I can do nothing now. My hands are tied by one stronger than myself. The hour of repose is past, and the decrees of Providence must be fulfilled. He then foretold of the death of the Queen, the complete ruin of the House of Bourbon, and the rise of Napoleon. 100 years after his ascension, Saint Germain had brought much enlightenment to the royal courts of Europe, and thanks to his efforts, the creation of the United States of America. Because of this service to humanity, the Great White Brotherhood of Light granted him the office of the Shohan of the Seventh Ray. According to occult philosophy, the seven rays are seven metaphysical principles that govern both individuals and 2,158 year astrological cycles. Our current astrological age of Pisces is dominated by religion and superstitions. Soon, this will be replaced with the age of Aquarius, which will bring about knowledge and wisdom. As director of the Shohan of the Seventh Ray, Saint Germain is responsible for transmuting the old energies of the past in order to bring about the Christ consciousness of the coming golden age of Aquarius. This is why Saint Germain is sometimes referred to as the Cosmic Master of the Age of Aquarius. After he became a Cosmic Master, Saint Germain was not permitted to work with any more individuals with the exception of Napoleon whom he backed and trained. But when Napoleon misused his power for his own demise, Saint Germain withdrew his support. At the end of the 18th century, his efforts to unify Europe now lie in ruins. While the Rothschilds continued to engulf the masses in their costly wars, the satanic cult of the Illuminati was now rotting out all the Masonic lodges. There was little else he could do but wait for a better time in which humanity would be more receptive to the ideas of a golden age. So he took a break from European politics and settled into bed. In 1790, Saint Germain confided his future plans with his Austrian friend Franz Graffer, saying, Tomorrow night I am off. I am much needed in Constantinople than in England there to prepare two new inventions which you will have in the next century, trains and steamboats. Towards the end of this century, I shall disappear out of Europe and betake myself to the region of the Himalayas. I will rest. I must rest. Exactly in 85 years will people again set eyes on me. Farewell. While in Tibet, Saint Germain studied under the Trans-Himalayan Brotherhood as a Shabalan master, who were exalted teachers known to possess wonderful powers. Little else is known of this period, but it is likely he could have traveled into the inner earth tunnels of Shambhala to study with other ascended masters. True to his promise, 85 years later, Saint Germain returned to Europe with a new goal in mind. In 1875, Saint Germain convinced the royal families and nations under colonial rule to merge their assets into one account known as the Combined International Collateral Accounts of the Global Debt Facility. They agreed to do this because they wanted to wait for the right time to release these funds so that it could benefit all the world's people. Only kings or queens, presidents, prime ministers, and in some cases ministers of finance are granted access to these accounts. The collateral accounts contain a minimum of 20 million metric tons of gold, thousands of tons of platinum and silver, and thousands of boxes of precious gems, sovereign certificates, which are collateralized by other mineral wealth, including oil, copper, uranium, and nickel, 
plus, there are works of art, sovereign monarch treasures, and ancient treasures, including Aztec, Egyptian, and King Solomon's gold. St. Germain placed the collateral accounts within the newly created Foundation Divine, which also contains the World Trust created back in 1729. After 250 years of compound interest, the World Trust has now mushroomed into a net worth in excess of one quattrodecian dollars, or a one with 45 zeros. Enough money to buy a gold cube the size of the orbit of Saturn. So astronomical, most people would not even believe it. These figures may appear to be far-fetched, considering the world GDP is $55 trillion annually. However, governments maintain two sets of accounting books, one which is displayed to the public, which contains official data issued by the government, and another secretive version, which is used between sovereign entities. It is this secretive ledger which contains both the collateral accounts and St. Germain's World Trust. Some of this wealth is stored in different dimensions, but much of it is stored under international treaty custodianship rules within the world's major banking houses. In the case of the collateral accounts, they are held within the Institutional Parent Administration account of the Federal Reserve under the control of the Bank of International Settlements, and in turn, Foundation Divine. This wealth is intended to be used to buy out all Illuminati-controlled governments, oil corporations, media conglomerates, banking houses, pharmaceutical cartels, and it would zero out all debt. It is estimated it would cost a minimum of a hundred quintillion dollars just to correct the world's current economic problems. In order for these funds to reach the common man, it must travel down through a series of 30,000 different trust funds beginning with World Trust. The top level contains the World Trust and remains under the trusteeship of Master Saint Germain. Under his orders, the World Court will activate the funding process. Level 2 contains 180 Royal Trusts, which are under the control of the trustees in various sovereign countries. Examples include the French Trust, the Russian Trust, and the Vatican Trust. Level 3 are the various Illuminati Family Trusts, which are under the control of the trustees of the world's wealthiest families, including the Warburg Trust, the Rothschild Trust, and the Rockefeller Trust. Level 4 contains the 250 plus corporate trusts under the control of the trustees from the world's most powerful companies and corporations, including General Electric, Lockheed, and AT&T. Level 5 contains the wealth from enlightened robber baron children, which was placed aside to be used for the benefit of all humanity. These are known as the Prosperity Program Trusts and Bank Roll Programs, and they are managed by the IMF under the guidance of St. Germain. Altogether, there are 72 various bank roll programs, including Bergerveen, Omega, and Freedom. The largest trust fund is Freedom, and this must be funded first. When this happens, St. Germain's wealth will finally reach the hands of all humanity. But if a problem occurs in this chain, the funding window will close. As the funds travel through each level, they must be signed off by four to five trustees per trust. If the trustees decide to block the money, then the funding process comes to an end. With each trust level, the trustees must only use certain designated safe banks and sign the proper documents with only certain designated banking personnel at those banks. Should this process be activated and then stalled by deceitful bankers or trustees, or if the deadline for funding certain trusts is not met in a timely manner, then the funding window will close. But this is the problem. Members of the Bush and Clinton families have been blocking the release of these funds because they are overseeing many of the trusts as trustees. After World War II from 1945 to 1995, the assets and the collateral accounts were managed by the Trilenium Trilateral Tripartite Commission, representing the United States of America, the United Kingdom, and France. This commission selected the dollar as an international reserve currency and gave the CIA legal responsibility to protect the collateral assets. Nations which did not want a permanent CIA presence on their soil will be allowed to subcontract the protection under the same terms and conditions of the treaties. Extensions of this agreement were expanded through international treaties, some of which are still classified as top secret. With the CIA now in charge of protecting these assets, it didn't take long before problems arrived. Sadly, certain rogue elements within the CIA and the Bush family have managed to steal over $200 trillion from the collateral accounts, stored in places like the Philippines, Thailand, and Russia. 
In 1981, Ronald Reagan commissioned Leo Wanta to steal $27.5 trillion from the collateral accounts in Russia, which was then used to crash the ruble, collapsing the Soviet Union. This money belongs to the Russian people and must be returned back to them. In the 1980s, while V.K. Durham was flipping through an old Bible, she found an 1875 Peruvian gold certificate with a face value of $1,000 plus accrued interest. Today, this bond is worth over $6.5 trillion, collateralized by gold from within the collateral accounts. When George Bush Sr. learned of this gold certificate, he tried unsuccessfully to get his hands on it. Eventually, V.K. Durham lost control over the money, and it now sits within St. Germain's World Trust. Instead of hiding this wealth somewhere in the United States, like Fort Knox, they chose to stash this loot for their own personal benefit in all places, a CIA-controlled depository in Montevideo, Uruguay. Remember, after World War II, Uruguay was considered a safe haven for escaping Nazis. The Bush family, known for their Nazi ties, have purchased large ranches in both Uruguay and Paraguay. They may think they can get away with crashing the world economy and hiding out with their stolen loot, but this will never happen. The world must hold these people accountable for their crimes. This stolen money is now being used for every New World Order pet project imaginable, ranging from NASA, militarized space weapons, electronic mind control, and financial warfare. If you ever wondered where they got the money to build those Black Project anti-gravity vehicles, look no further as all treaties are classified top secret. In 1963, President Kennedy tried to stop this illegal activity and bring this wealth to the people of the world through the Green Hilton Agreement. This would allow the United States, as holders of the international reserve currency, to print a new gold-backed currency using assets from the collateral accounts to boost economic development throughout the world. On June 4, 1963, President Kennedy signed Executive Order 11110, which would strip the Federal Reserve Bank of its ability to loan money to the United States with interest, and it required a bullion-backed currency issued by the U.S. Treasury instead of the Federal Reserve Bank. Soon after, $2 and $5 notes backed by silver were issued, which read United States note instead of Federal Reserve note. Certain elements within the world's elite could not let this happen, and thus, Kennedy had to go. The Green-Hilton Agreement and Executive Order 11110 were both signed into law, but shortly after Kennedy's death was unrecognized by the United States and later other nations of the world. To curtail these illegal activities, in 1995, the Trilinium Trilateral Tripartite Commission was stripped of its power and placed under the control of the United Nations. The collateral accounts now remain under the supervision of St. Germain and Dr. Tsai Sheng Li of Nationalist China under the Office of International Treasury Control at the UN. Despite these actions, the U.S. corporate government, the World Bank, the Bank of International Settlements, and the IMF continue their illegal activities without giving a care for the needs of the people of the world. In international finance, there is a term known as arbitrage, which allows one to profit in a short period of time from rolling money over and over again. This has allowed the robber barons and Illuminati elitists to generate enormous amounts of wealth by raping the world of its assets through either insider trading or by manufacturing money using fractional reserve banking. When a banker is licensed to create money through fractional reserve banking, they have been given the right to create money out of thin air. This occurs when a bank loans out a proportion of their assets at a rate of say 1 to 10. In other words, a bank must have $1 deposits on their balance sheet for every $9 of loans. The other 9 tenths is simply manufactured out of thin air. After the debt is paid in full, the banks simply delete this money from their ledgers, causing it to vanish from thin air. These loans are then spent throughout the economy and eventually fall into the hands of the average American to be spent in their day-to-day -day lives. However, while these loans are increasing the size of the money supply, the interest portion of these loans are decreasing it at a faster rate. This is because banks do not issue enough money into the money supply to cover the interest payments of these loans. Therefore, more and more debt has to be issued to continue financing the ever-growing interest debt bubble. Eventually, everyone but the parasitic bankers will run out of money, allowing them to foreclose on the entire world. While the masses were enslaved under fractional reserve banking, the elites were profiting handsomely. 
By using the power of leverage, a bank could bring in a 63% annual profit margin, assuming a conservative lending ratio of 1 to 10 and an interest rate of 7%. In this example, a bank has $10 million of deposits and $90 million of loans. At an interest rate of 7%, this $90 million loan portfolio would rake in $6.3 million of profit annually. A $6.3 million profit margin doesn't sound so bad considering the original investment was only $10 million. However, this crude example does not account for the carry trade or fancy derivatives which could easily enhance the banker's profits in excess of 300% annually. Wealthy investors are able to tap in these profits by investing in bank trades which are conducted on a monthly basis. At the end of each month, money is then rolled again, thus giving it the name of the bank roll programs. The prosperity funds, which originate from confiscated accounts taken from the Federal Reserve, were also placed into these bank roll programs, but more about this later. Today, there are at least 72 bank roll programs, including Bergerin, Savage, SBC Charcoal, ITI, Morgan, Hong Kong, Omega, and Freedom. They are maintained and audited by Price Waterhouse, the IMF, and the Treasury of the Republic of the United States, and are deposited in IMF-controlled offshore banks. The reason you may never heard of these secretive trading programs is because investors are required to have a minimum of $100 million or more just to make a trade. Any inquiries about these programs are deflected and attention is instead focused on the warnings issued by government agencies about fake programs. When combined with numerous prosecutions of fraudulent high yield investment transactions that occur each year, the public is led to believe that these programs do not exist. Around the turn of the century, some of the wealthy robber baron children placed aside a small amount of their family's money into these programs to be used for the benefit of all the people in the world. These wealthy investors are known as wealthy visionaries or white knights. In the early 1990s, they invited a few wealthy multiple level marketers to open up an accumulator account at the IMF, allowing them to make a bank trade within the bank roll programs with less money. But this was a big mistake and soon word of these programs began to spread, allowing any investor to invest in these bank roll programs with as little as $100. These small amounts were handled by trustees who collected the money and kept records and combined the small investments into a larger amount such as $1 million that was required to enter a roll. These accumulator accounts were eventually closed to new investors in the 1990s. However, the original investors are still waiting to be paid because payment can only be made with a gold-backed currency. Otherwise, the Federal Reserve bankers would just steal the money under the current fiat credit system. The bankers angry that the bank roll programs were found out by the people fought long and hard to stop the programs from funding. Even though thousands of people had invested money and a great deal of wealth was generated, little, if anything, was ever paid back to the investors. Corruption, greed, and murder became widespread among the bankers, government, and even some trustees who stole the money for themselves. Program managers were lied to, bribed, and many were hauled into court under false pretense, such as trustees Clyde Hood and Mike Kodowski. Some investors were offered their money back, but most refused to accept payment because they did not trust the government. 